provinces are not subsidiaries of the federal government. We do not believe the federal government has the constitutional right to impose this carbon tax on Saskatchewan industries, jobs and families. By issuing this reference today, we're confirming that we believe that we have the jurisdiction to ensure that if there was a catastrophic diluted bitumen spill, we have the ability to take steps to protect our economy and our environment. Carbon tax, still two very bad words in Saskatchewan, and pipeline, these days a bad word in lots of parts of British Columbia. That was Premier Scott Moe on Wednesday and Premier John Horgan just this morning, both going to court, both hoping to prove to the federal government that their province is their business. Where does that leave one of Trudeau's favourite phrases, that the economy and the environment go hand in hand? We have at issue for all of those kinds of questions. Andrew Coyne is in Toronto tonight, Chantal Hébert is in Montreal, and Chachi Curl joins us from Vancouver. Good to see everybody. Okay, so interesting uh, the way these two stories are connected and how they are playing out and will likely not have the same kind of outcome. Chantal, let's start with you. When we hear Premier Mo from Saskatchewan saying that provinces are not subsidiaries of the federal government, what does that tell you about sort of the state of federal provincial relations right now? Well, he is stating the obvious as stated by the Supreme Court and the beer ruling. That being said, um, his court uh, challenge uh, is of importance, for instance, to the Conservatives who are vying for power in Ontario and for the Conservatives who are hoping to take power in Alberta, uh, i.e. there is more than one province that wants to test this. This mm -hmm. is just the first test. Uh, and uh, it's going to matter uh, for the federal capacity to impose that carbon tax on provinces that do not want to put their own price or a price that corresponds to the federal requirement on carbon. Andrew, how does that relate to the reference that uh, John Horgan put forward today? Well, it's, it is interesting, as you say, that you have both happening at the same time. You have one province, Saskatchewan, saying, of course the federal government can legislate on pipelines, but it can't legislate on carbon taxes. The government of B.C. saying, of course it can legislate on carbon taxes, but it can't possibly legislate on pipelines. And if, if both of them have their way, then rather than doing both a carbon tax and a pipeline, as the federal government would prefer, we'll do neither. Uh, which would be such a Canadian result. You know, I don't mind, <laughs> I don't mind if I don't get what I want, just as long as I can keep you from getting what you want. Uh, look, you know, of course the provinces aren't subsidiaries of the federal government, but the federal government is not a subsidiary of the provinces either. It has legitimate jurisdiction. I suspect yeah. the courts will find in both these cases it does in the end, but we'll waste a lot of time in the process. Well, and I wonder if that's not sort of the point. Certainly in the case of B.C., it must be, uh, Shachi, that, that the Premier is just trying to delay things in hopes that the project will go away. Well, look, to the extent that to many people in many parts of the country, this may look like a bunch of recalcitrant yahoos trying to play to their political bases because it works and, and, and run the clock down. Uh, the implications for both of these decisions are actually quite important. In B.C., uh, a negative ruling from the courts. If the courts come back and say, British Columbia, you don't have the jurisdiction, uh, what that uh, signals to the people of British Columbia, the vast majority of whom want to actually see uh, the B.C. government, the Horgan government, put its tools down and walk away in the event that the courts rule against the B.C. government, they have mm -hmm. no appetite for a constitutional bun fight with the rest of the country, it actually then changes the debate and the conversation from one about pipelines, as you mentioned, bad word at the beginning of this little chat, to an even worse word, tankers. What British mm. Columbians really want to hear about from the provincial government and the other parties here is what is the plan for spill prevention and response at sea? That is the sticking point. Now, in Saskatchewan, it's not just about jurisdiction. Does the federal government have jurisdiction to impose a carbon tax, but the way in which it happens. And, of course, the Saskatchewan government is arguing that they already know from the Manitoba decision that the federal government has the jurisdiction to impose a carbon tax. It's just the way they do it. Okay, Chantal, let me hear you weigh in on, on the B.C. part of it and, and mm -hmm. how, yes. how real that is and what that is actually about, do you think? Well, it is real in the sense that if the company, Kinder Morgan, wants certainty as to... Uh, its capacity to move oil through that pipeline 
and the quantity of oil that it's, it would be expanding the pipeline for, that certainty from the legal standpoint is not going to be coming by May 31st. No. It's going to take, someone said, more than a month. Yes, for sure more than a month and possibly longer uh, than a year if this goes to the Supreme Court. So if what Kinder Morgan was looking for was certainty uh, that it was building or expanding a pipeline for its product, it's not going to get that. No matter what anyone says about the federal government as jurisdiction, you mm -hmm. just don't know. So the uncertainty will be remaining. And to add a word about the Saskatchewan thing, even if the pipeline did get built tomorrow, it would not change the fact that Saskatchewan is going to court over the carbon tax and that other conservative parties, if they were in power, would like to go to court. One is not contingent on the other. You can see the beginning of an exit ramp, though, for the B.C. government in this yeah. reference in the, in the third of the three questions they're asking. So the first two are, you know, do we have generally this kind of... Uh, legislative competence to, to legislate on environmental matters. Secondly, can we apply it to interprovincial pipelines? And the courts will probably give a yes but on that. But the third one is, what happens if there's legis federal legislation that, that basically sets down the rules for this? And, and does, does provincial legislation have to give way? Yes, it does. I'm sure the courts will rule. And that's where this pending federal legislation yes. may come into yes. play, that it yes. actually lays down those rules and the courts say. Now, the, the flying the ointment there is the, the reference question asks about existing federal legislation. So there'll be, I guess, a question of you know, when does this legislation come in, the federal legislation? But they would need to move pretty quickly with that. I, yeah. You know, I don't know what what the timeline is for them, but as Chantal says, if May 31st is this drop-dead date in some way for Kinder Morgan, that will have to start moving very, very quickly to yeah, reassure there is people. No way. It's, it's, yeah. Let's be clear. There Chantal is no way yeah. that a, a serious court, and I, the B.C. Court of Appeal is a serious court, will hear a reference and pronounce on it by May 31st. That's no. not going to happen. Yeah. No. But the legislation could be tabled before that. That's right. And the feds yeah. can bring in what they've also talked about doing, which is some kind of financial backstop. What I would hope is it's, it's one that's kind of contingent. In other words, if the pipeline is delayed or, or you know, beyond endurance, then we'll compensate you rather than giving the money up front. And okay. I think that would, that would give Kinder Morgan the, the kind of assurance it can, it can properly require. It, we want to prevent Kinder Morgan from gaming this at the same time. But I sure. think they have a legitimate issue on that. Okay, Shachi, you wanted in there. Yeah, and, and to that point, I think this is now almost going a little bit beyond Kinder Morgan. Uh, this, this may transcend Kinder Morgan. They have said that they'll walk away or they're, they're very close to walking away, but into that vacuum has come and flown the, the governments of Alberta and, and uh, the government of, of Canada. So, mm. uh, you know, when Justin Trudeau talks about this pipeline will be built, uh, this is now no longer, again, about what, what Kinder Morgan does. And I think to Andrew's point, they, they have played this quite uh, astutely, quite smartly. They may simply walk away, leaving Canadian taxpayers holding the bill on this. And again, it doesn't solve the problem or the sticking point in British Columbia for three quarters of them, even those who, who support this project. They're very, very worried about that coastline issue. And we saw a little bit of movement today with that letter from yeah. Minister McKenna to John Horgan, the Premier of BC, saying, look, we'll work with you a little bit more on this. That is the direction Ottawa needs to be moving in in order to, to finally find some endpoint to this conflict. I just wonder where this leaves, though, the federal government, who, as I said <laughs> off the top there, the, the Prime Minister talking always about how you can balance the economy and the environment. And I just want to show people quickly what, what the Parliamentary Budget Officer released this week about the cost of, of carbon taxes, saying that it will cost $10 billion off the GDP by 2022. So, I mean, that to me, I don't know, does that mean you have to have the pipeline built or does it mean that you can't actually balance those two things, Chantal? Um. I'm not sure that uh, it means you need the pipeline built, although you want the strongest economy that you can and possibly a healthier uh, oil industry goes in that direction. But what the uh, parliamentary budget officer also said is that you could mitigate the impact of the carbon tax on the economy depending on how government handle the revenue from that tax yes. and, and whether they use it structurally or they use it just to send you a check so that you can go and say, I got my money back from the carbon tax. So uh, this $10 billion is not the last word. It's kind of an invitation to structure it intelligently. Yeah, it's, it's, 
you know, if they, as Chantel says, if they just give the money back as a kind of a lump sum, mm -hmm. then yeah, you get this a half a percentage point, which is not the end of the world to begin with, a half a percentage point off of GDP. If they use it to cut tax rates, then, it, then that impact, the, the PBO calculates, is reduced to about one-tenth of one percent of GDP, which would, people wouldn't even notice. Mm -hmm, so it mm -hmm. does place a premium on doing the, the, the policy right. But look, we have a slim to none chance at this point of meeting our 2030 uh, Paris Accord commitments. The slim thing is if we do it by carbon pricing. If we don't do carbon pricing, then it's not, we're not going to get anywhere near there, and we're only going to get carbon pricing if we build that pipeline. About 10 seconds, Shachi, last word. Okay, at the end of the day, for Canadians, they're not necessarily paying attention to, to cost to GDP or to economic growth, but where yeah. the vulnerability for this government is, uh, if Canadians, as they are pumping gas in this summer of escalating gas prices, are now uh, more aware of the impact of carbon pricing on that, it's something that sticks in their mind. It makes the party vulnerable on that promise of affordability and making life easier for the middle class that they campaigned on as we march towards an election. And, of course, it also makes them a little bit vulnerable on that promise to steward and, and keep the economy growing well. Uh, it doesn't matter what the real details are here. It matters the perception of it and what the opposition does with it. And they have the potential to have a field day with it. Okay. Good talk, everybody. Thank you for being here. And good news if you want more of us talking. <laughs> At Issue is also a podcast. Extra content and the main panel every week. And this week's bonus topic, Kathleen Wynne says it's a disagreement between accountants. Ontario's Auditor General says it's a $5 billion fib. What's the difference? Find out. iTunes, any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national.